Yeah, a female monarch can lay three to 500 eggs in her lifetime. They'll just move from plant to plant. Usually they lay one egg on the underside of a milkweed leaf and hop to the next plant. They don't actually stay in the same area. They'll move, they'll satisfy a patch and then kind of move on to the next patch in the landscape. Hmm. Ooh, 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 I found one, an egg. See right here? That is a monarch egg. Monarch populations have, have dramatically declined from, from historic numbers. Um, there's a multitude of different factors that are influencing that decline. Uh, as most, most insects, monarchs um, have kind of a boom and bust. And so in good conditions and good weather conditions, they can recover quickly, but they can also, that can also be dramatic in causing their populations to decline. And then that's exaggerated by things like habitat loss and, and the widespread use of pesticides across the landscape. And so um, we're looking at this multitude of threats that, that affect their overall population size. Monarchs are really familiar, and so a lot of people have that experience, whether they, they observed them in their kindergarten classroom or second grade classroom, um, or saw them migrating in the fall during childhood. Everybody has that familiarity and experience with monarchs as this common species, an iconic species. And so the, the thought of that monarchs are in trouble, that monarch populations have declined, is really a draw to help people getting involved in helping conserve them. Uh, monarch Joint Venture is a national nonprofit organization working in conservation of monarch and monarchs and pollinators. Um, we work across with 130 different organizations across the country doing habitat conservation, education and outreach, science and monitoring, and of, of course collaboration and, and partnership. There are a lot of different ways we, we observe monarch populations. So we um, run a few different monitoring programs, one for community scientists called the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project where people are out in their milkweed patch reporting to us what eggs and caterpillars they're seeing and that allows us to see how monarchs are doing throughout the season. We also run a, a more robust science program, the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program, that allows us to capture what's happening more broadly across the landscape. Uh, North American monarchs, so we think about them um, in different populations, east of the Rocky Mountains, west of the Rocky Mountains, and then there's a small non-migratory population in southern Florida. So the eastern migratory population, all the butterflies that are, um, reside east of the Rocky Mountains that migrate to central Mexico, this is by and far the largest population of monarchs in North America. And then the population west of the Rocky Mountains primarily migrates to the coast of California. The upper Midwest is um, one of the key breeding and production areas for the eastern monarch population. So without um, you know, we see a lot of the monarchs that reach Mexico in, in the winter are coming from this upper Midwest. And so this is a really important breeding area for monarchs and, and doing conservation here is integral to our conservation of the species. When we think about monarch conservation and conserving the habitats that they need, yes, milkweed is really important, um, a really important part of that equation, but we're also looking for habitat that supports all pollinators and a variety of different wildlife species. So a variety of different wildflowers that bloom throughout the growing season. Um, as long as that milkweed is in the mix and it, it's providing these multiple benefits. If I, well, I already have these three species in my yard, um, but if I had to pick just three, I would pick of course, some species of milkweed, probably common milkweed because it's the, the most likely to um, be abundant and support monarchs. I would choose pasque flower. It is my favorite native plant and it blooms very early in the spring, which is critical for that, those early pollinators. Um, and finally, I would choose meadow blazing star, which is by and far monarchs favorite plant to nectar from here in the Midwest. So in the fall, as milkweeds are starting to senesce and the days are getting shorter and the temperatures are getting cooler, these combination of environmental cues are telling monarchs in the fall that it's time to leave, that this habitat's not gonna be suitable for them for much longer. And so that 
causes them to emerge in the state of what we call reproductive diapause, and that's what starts the, the fall migration south, usually around the middle of August. As monarchs are gearing up for migration, they're, they're relying on those fall blooming species, those, those goldenrod and asters that, that bloom late into the season to store up their fat reserves for the long migration and the overwintering period in Mexico. So the more fall species we can provide them with, the better off they're going to be in their migration and overwintering period. At home, you can. Um, there's a lot of different thing, ways to help monarch butterflies. We're first and foremost, we're looking at all the different ways we can get high quality habitat, native plant habitat, back on the landscape. So whether that's your backyard garden or a community park that you go to often, or the the family farm, there are a lot of different opportunities to get that habitat back out on the landscape. And um, beyond that, you know, talking to friends and neighbors and family members about monarchs and monarch conservation. Monarchs are beautiful and the way to attract them to your landscape is to plant these native plants, host plants and different wildflowers that they need. And so the importance of restoring some of these landscapes to more natural spaces is essential in drawing in these, these amazing pollinators that we care about. <laughs>